Showtime, I'm Brent Holland. Welcome to the show, Night Fright. Folks, two and a half years ago, I started this show called Night Fright from this very studio. The reason why I started it, of course, is because I had just moved from Montreal to Sudbury, where this show is emanating from, Laurentian University, right here at CKLU Studios. For those of you listening online, just imagine a standard radio studio, earphones, microphones. For those of you watching online, you are able to see the studio, of course. Now, two and a half years ago when I started the show, I started it because, unfortunately, you cannot get a show that I was a huge fan of called Coast to Coast in Sudbury. You can only get it in major urban areas across the country in Canada, which means Montreal, of course, Toronto, Vancouver, and Ottawa, etc., etc. You can't get it in the small urban centers such as Sudbury. So, when a communique came around asking for radio hosts, I'd never hosted a radio show before in my life, I decided that it would be a nice idea, as I had been a fan of a show called Coast to Coast, and Art Bell started the show, of course, in 92. George Norrie took it over, I think it was 2000 and, 2001, 2002, and George has been a guest on this show. I decided to do something similar. Well, two and a half years later, Night Fright, because of you, has become the number one Canadian-based show of its genre from coast to coast to coast. Three coasts in Canada, of course, folks. On that first show, July 2nd, 2008, the fella sitting next to me, Michel Deschamps, Monsieur UFO, was my first guest. I thought it only fitting to end the final, UF, the final Night Fright show here from CKLU Studios. Now, I just want to tell you right away, folks, Night Fright is continuing. It will continue. It's just that I'm moving from Sudbury, and this is the last show from this particular studio. Michel Deschamps was that guest. How great is that? He has returned tonight to be the final guest from the final show from CKLU Studios. It is going to be one explosive show tonight. Stick around, strap in, and hang on, because here we go. There is a time to question. There is a time for answers. There is a time to challenge. There is a time to speculate. There is a time for change. There is a time for truth. The time is now. Welcome to Night Fright, your voice in the dark for paranormal and conspiracy radio. And now your host, Brent Holland. Welcome, welcome, one and all, to Night Fright. I'm your host, Brent Holland. Sitting beside me, Michel Deschamps. Michel, say hi to the folks. Hi, folks. <laughs> Michel Deschamps, folks. Mr. UFO. Michel, two and a half years ago, my God, it goes fast. Yeah. Just like that. Yeah. I can't believe it. And you're, gracious, you're so gracious to join us tonight. I'm so happy for that, folks. Let's jump in right away, shall we? Let's talk about... UFO Man, which is your upcoming documentary right here, shot right here in Sudbury, three years in the making. It's going to be out coming up in July. We are in November right now. Well, actually, I, it, there's a good possibility. We're hoping it'll come out next fall, but it may come out the following fall. It all depends. There's been, there's been problems with weather and uh, free time for the filmmaker, Matthew Fish, to come over and grab some extra shots, some fillers as he calls them, uh, basically wants to interview my friends and uh, other acquaintances, uh, but uh, things haven't really panned out and time is pressing because... What kind of things can the people expect to see in UFO Man? Now obviously you are the MUFON director for Ontario, and let me tell you a cute story behind this folks, I just want to set this up properly. 
Stanton Friedman, as, fan, as fans of this show will know, has been on this show, um, along with many, many other UFO aficionados. Um, uh, the fellow there from Don Ledger. Don Ledger. Thank you. I, I, I apologize to Don. It's just that, you know, when you get to my age. <laughs> <laughs> I tried to get Stan on this show. He was hesitant to come on the show. Of course, he'd never heard of the show before. But the second I mentioned Michelle's name to him, he said, oh, well, if Mike says it's okay to come on the show, I'm going to come on the show too. And sure enough, Stanton Friedman now has been a guest on the show twice. That shows you the kind of stature and the kind of fortitude this man has right across the country. His reputation is impeccable. Michelle only tells the truth. Another funny story, as I mentioned, Two and a half years ago, Michelle was my very first guest on this show. I said to Michelle, Michelle, what have you brought with you? He says, well, I have 176 sightings. And I thought, okay, you know, Canada's pretty, well, I guess a lot of people have seen UFOs in the Maritimes, at West, of course, and certainly here in Sudbury. He goes, no, this is only from Sudbury. Holy cow. I was absolutely <laughs> flabbergasted. You're listening to Night Fright. Your voice in the dark for paranormal and conspiracy radio. The time is now. And now your host, Brent Holland. What was your first sighting? You know, on your website, you say that you've had 24, 26 20, sightings? 27 sightings 27 since 1974. Sightings. I've never yeah. had a single sighting, and yeah. I keep looking at the sky. Tell me about your first sighting and what was that spark? What was that moment that said, this is the direction I want to go in, in my life? Um, well, my first sighting took place in July of 1974. And I think what happened was basically it was by pure accident because my brother's birthday is on the 13th of July. And back then where I had my sighting, uh, there used to be a two story building where on the second floor, the teenagers would have their teen dances. Mm -hmm. And on the f main floor, on the ground floor, there would be finger painting for the kids, especially during summer months. And so it seemed to make sense to me that being my brother's birthday, that my parents would chew us out of the house and say, there, just go there and, you know, go outside. It's nice out. It's the summer. I had a tendency of you know, hiding down in the basement where eventually I had my apartment there for a while. But, so I went to the end of the street and um, I don't know if, I don't think I did finger painting, but I was standing outside the back facing south. Uh, I remember seeing a guy in a baseball diamond field playing 21 by himself. And I looked over the treetops looking south towards Sudbury and I see this sphere, this, this silver metallic sphere just hovering above the trees. Big sphere, small sphere? Well, considering the size that I was at the time, I would have imagined that the thing was probably no more than maybe a meter wide, maybe oh, a meter that's and a half. Off? Oh, yeah. Oh, you see, uh, right away when you, when you told me this story, Michelle, I was thinking of, I don't know, something maybe 50 feet or... Oh, no, no, no. Huge, huge no, ship or no, something. No, no, no. This was just a little sphere. Yeah, well, if you consider like a meter and a half in width, uh, small, um, from what I remember, I remember seeing a sock flag, like the type of flags that you see at the airport, you know, sure. with the red and white bands. Mm -hmm. And uh, the direction of the wind. Yeah. yeah. I don't know why that was there. Well, the other thing that was there before, they built some new homes. That's where it's standing there now. It's a bunch of new homes. There was U-Haul trailers and a, an aluminum shed and just a gravel, like a large parking lot area looking well, thing. I'm curious now, when you saw this sphere. Yeah. What were your feelings? Did you feel it was, were you frightened? Did you think it, perhaps it was just a, a toy? Um, no, to me it seems like it was just like seconds that I saw, that I had the sighting. And I don't remember seeing it leave. I don't remember seeing it arrive and position itself over the trees. I just remember seeing it. And I thought mm -hmm. for years that maybe it was just something that I memorized from watching TV because I watched a lot of sci-fi. I grew mm -hmm. up... Mm -hmm. uh, how this really started, my interest with space, mm -hmm. is I remember sitting down with my dad in 1969 and watching the lunar landing live on TV. Sure, sure. Yeah. And so anything I had as a toy, whether it was a Fisher-Price airplane, mm -hmm. uh, I would use as a flying saucer, or just a ship or whatever, some type. Understood. You're listening to Night Fright, your voice in the dark for paranormal and conspiracy radio. The time is now. And now your host, 
Brent Holland. Now, Michelle, what was that pivotal moment for you? What was that moment that said, you know what, I'm going to pursue this for more than just a passing interest. I want to really explore what is going on here. Um, the reason why I ask you that is I'm sure there are people out there right now yeah. that have had a similar experience to you. And I just want to reassure them that this is nothing that's going to get them in trouble or nothing that's going to get them in danger. Yeah. Um, I think it started in high school. In high school is when I really, really uh, switched gears and I started collecting UFO reports from teachers, mm -hmm. from students. And uh, I would go to the library, not just at school, but anywhere else I could find books on UFOs and actually collected all of the sketches. I would actually trace them. Back then I would trace them and uh, collected all the information I could find and created this easy access book that I had so that everything would be at my fingertips if somebody had questions for me about UFOs, whether or not they left vapor trails. Some do, most of them don't. Sound, some of them have sound, some of them don't, most of them don't. And uh, then I just kept on researching and nothing had really happened in terms of sightings until October of 1990. And I think that's the one sighting that got me to come out of the ufological closet, so to speak. Okay. Now, was that so profound a sighting that you were frightened with that? Or uh, how did it affect you? Okay, let's tell yeah, that story. Yeah, yeah. If you were. It's for, for people who don't know what it's like to actually see something at an age where you recognized immediately that you're looking at something that's totally out of the ordinary. Mm -hmm. I was a, I was a, uh, back then I worked at a dealership. And in the summer of 1990, I met this man who worked at Inco for years, and he had had a lot That's of Valley sales. Inco folks in Sudbury is yeah. a, um, uh, a mining company. A large mining company. Yeah, employs a lot of people here in Sudbury. And I was working one day at this dealership, and one of the salespeople said, hey, you got to check out this guy's license plates. So I went over, and I saw UFO Don, and I, I said, man, i got to meet this guy. So even though I had like a 15 minute break, we spoke for about half an hour, we exchanged phone numbers and addresses and found out that he had had a lot of sightings in the late 60s. Mm. Um, years later I found out that he was a skeptic in the 50s but he had had a sighting, his first sighting was in 1966 right up till about 69 until they started trickling off. Okay. But, so we spoke and um, Eventually, he's the one who pretty well convinced me to look into the Sudbury Star for newspapers. But I met him that summer, and I, was, I wasn't I was sure. I didn't have a lot of other friends that were open-minded to the UFO subject. So when October of 1990 came around, mm -hmm. um, he had lent me some old 1967 Flying Saucer magazine, which he eventually gave to me. I have the original copies. And... I, wa I was going back to the dealership that night, uh, mm -hmm. that particular night, to do make photocopies, oddly enough, mm -hmm. you know, of flying saucer magazines. And as I'm walking outside, diagonally towards my car, I'm looking towards the south, towards Sudbury, and I'm on hop, top, back, back then, Toss Automobiles was on top of a hill, so I had a mm -hmm. good view of the valley. And I see this bright light that actually seemed to be getting brighter as it was coming down at a f somewhat 45, 30 degree angle. Mm -hmm. And so, I knew it was coming down because it was getting brighter as it was gradually coming down. It wasn't coming down in a straight line. Uh, but it looked like Jupiter at its brightest, but yet you could see a noticeable movement. So obviously that wasn't Jupiter at all. So I came back into the dealership and I told one of the salespeople and he walked to the window. He was still in the showroom and you could see, you could see it from the inside. So I said, so he just shrugged his shoulders and walked away. I said, well, shit, and so I'm going to go in and check this out. And I was going home, I had finished making my photocopies. So as I'm driving down the hill, I can see the object through the houses, between the houses and between the trees and all that. Stopped at the house, told my dad, hey dad, I think there's a flying saucer fly flying between Sudbury and Hanmer. And the neighbor was there and they both chuckled. I grabbed my binoculars and then I thought, well, where can I go? So I went to the next street over and at the very end, there was a dirt road that led into the bush. And this is October, so the, tr the trees are bare of That's leaves. Right. Sure. And by then, the radiating light coming yes. off the object had dissipated, so it looked like a white egg in a distance. And so I'm looking at it through the trees, between the trees, and all of a sudden it disappeared. And yeah, so, how, how big was the light at uh, this point? 
if you could try and through the binoculars, like even I went back the next day outside to see. It looked at about maybe the size of. To me, it looked like the the length of a car, like I, I, like far away. But I mean, okay. through but the bigger. binoculars, like it wasn't. It didn't take up the entire uh, focal Understood. point of the binocular. But what kind of char characteristics did it display that kind of told you that this is not an airplane? It's not a helicopter. Just the fact that it was oval in shape and it mm -hmm. put out light. I mean, the whole. It was an oval light, and it, oval shaped light. The light, did it just kind of emanate? Did it just kind of glow or was there an actual beam from it? No, it just glowed. It just glowed. It just glowed. But uh, the, before, before when I first saw it, I mean, you, you, you saw spikes on it. It looked like really bright, really? like a bright planet, but then it dissipated and it looked like an egg, like with mm -hmm. actual solid edges. You know, it was defined edges. Mm -hmm. And when it blinked out, I thought, well, shit, I must have had like maybe a is behind a branch somewhere. So I actually crouched down with my binoculars. I'm still looking and it's not there. And then I'm waiting, I'm waiting, and all of a sudden it reappeared, but it reappeared at a lower elevation. Okay. And then from the corner of my eye, I noticed these bright lights to my far left, which later I found out there was um, a, transformi a transformation or transformer house housing area ah, for electricity. Sure, and they sure. had just installed these large football football stadium lights kind of thing at uh -huh. the corner. So I tried to make sure that I wasn't mistaking these lights for the object I was looking at. So you were eliminating the obvious to make sure yeah. that this is what it was. But at the same time, I was getting pissed off because I was in the bush and I said, I got to find my, uh, uh, I got to go somewhere where I can get a good view. Mm -hmm. So I thought of the, the hill, as you leave Hanmer, you either turn left towards north to go to Cape Real, mm -hmm. or south to go on Radar Road. And if you go straight, you're going towards farmer's fields, mm -hmm. and there's a hilltop there. So I headed towards there, and I'm looking at the sky, and I can't see the object anymore. But when the object reappeared, I, I, later on, I found out why it disappeared and reappeared, to uh, my personal opinion. Mm -hmm. I'll explain that in a, in a minute. But uh, as I crested the hill, I couldn't see the object, and I, I parked my car. It was a 1985 Chevette I had at the time, and I had my binoculars with me. I had a flashlight in the car. And I'm panning from west to east, and I couldn't see anything at all until I'm looking almost southeast and right about where the radar base used to be. Uh, although you can't see the base, but based on the lamp, lamp, lamp post along the highway, you mm -hmm. can tell where the, where the radar base was. And just a little bit to the east of there is the airport. I see this big pinkish red light pulsating almost irregularly like a heartbeat. Oh. So through the binoculars, it looked brighter and bigger than what I'd seen before, which was pure white. And I'm just like, the, the hairs of the back of my neck just like stood right up. I had to brace my elbows on the roof of my car to stabilize my binoculars. My knees were buckling. And I'm looking into the car, and I see the flashlight there. And I say, <laughs> I said to myself, am I flashing? Because I could signal that thing. And later on, I bought a map, and I was exactly four and a half miles away from the object. I got to stop you right there, because you see... In my case, and I'm sure in most people's cases, we would have bolted. <laughs> like you would, well, the, the dust would have been, you know, right yeah. up and behind the car. I, I, yeah. What is it that kept you there? Like, were you well, afraid? Well, I, I wasn't kept there long enough. The thing, the thing was, I, I saw it. I saw it. I'm looking through the binoculars, and it's there, and it's there. And I'm looking around, and I say, okay, I got to get witnesses because I'm by myself, or nobody's going to believe this. So. I actually left the area, put on my hazard lights, I drove like a maniac down the hill, crossed the train tracks, came to the house looking for my anybody, my mom, my youngest brother, whatever, couldn't find anybody until I found somebody. They came back, we went back, we get there and the object is gone. So I don't know if it took off straight up. So I brought them back home and I took off and I went all the way to the town of Falconbridge looking for this thing. And they might have been long gone by then. I couldn't see it because I heard cases where it probably maneuvered from one town to the next or whatever. Couldn't find it. Um, but the next day, I went back because I wanted to know exactly how big it looked through my binoculars. Mm -hmm. So I went back to the hilltop and I aimed it in the direction of the radar base. Okay. And the one section of the base, which was a perfect cube, mm -hmm. it looked to be about the same width as that through the binoculars. Wow. So... I was really pressing to find somebody who would accompany me there, so I got two people from the South Side Story, a local little tabloid paper, okay. to come with me. And my purpose was to climb up there. We actually walked through 20, 
20, 20 minutes of bush, 20 minutes walk up the bush to uh, to the location, and the gate was wide open, so you walk back in back then, no problem. And uh, <laughs> I was just I was just in a hurry to measure the building, but uh, these two guys were smokers, so I let them have their cigarette. And after that, we proceeded to, to measure the building, and it turned out to be about 40 feet by 40 feet. So I'm estimating that the object was 40 feet wide, and it just hovered there. So, and the funny thing is, my assumption is that it was checking out the radar base to see why it was no longer functioning, because the radar base had been closed in 1986-87. Let's talk about that in a second, folks. We're speaking with Michel Deschamps tonight, UFO man, as he's known here in town, Sudbury, Ontario. He's the MUFON director, actually for all of Ontario. You're listening to Night Fright, your voice in the dark for paranormal and conspiracy radio. The time is now. And now your host, Brent Holland. www.nightfrightshow.com, www.nightfrightshow.com. As always, click on Michelle's picture. He's gonna be the good guy, good looking guy with the beard. Click on his picture right on that website. Take it right to his website, which is newfors.com, www.newfors.com. It is the only bilingual UFO site in Canada, and it's impeccably done. There's photos there with all kinds of things of the things Michelle's discussing tonight. There are uh, testimonials. There are sightings. Uh, you can contact Michelle, of course, from his website if you have something similar to offer. Michelle is there. He's ready, available to listen to you and hear your story without question. Um, let's go back to that radar yeah. station. Now that seems to be, seems to have been a hub. It is no longer in existence now. No. They've taken it down. Yeah. Cold War is over. But for some reason, that seems to have been something that the UFOs have gravitated to. And where I'm going to go with this, I'm going to create an arc right now. We're going to go to Area 51 after we discuss this because okay. to me there's similarities between the two. Yeah. Let's talk about that radar site. What was there? and what you think the UFOs were after. Well, I'm sh I have a feeling that just like in a case where an, um, a plane has a lock on, let's say on another enemy fighter, mm -hmm. that the enemy fighter can tell that it's been locked on, right? Okay. So back in 1975, in November of 1975, there was an intrusion of UFOs at four American bases. Really? And Falkenbridge, which was made famous in a book, uh, Above Top Secret, written by Timothy Good, the worldwide UFO cover-up. Now, Falkenbridge, folks, for those of you that are unaware, is just to the north of Sudbury, and indeed that's where the radar station was located that we're discussing yeah. right now. Okay. And in 1975, um, November the 11th, as a matter of fact, banner headlines in the Sudbury Star. You have uh, U.S. jets scrambled on UFOs. Really? And the reason why the U.S. jets would scream in from Michigan is because we were part of the 22nd Squadron and North Bay is part of the 23rd Squadron. Oh, I see. And North Bay was equipped with the CF-100 at that time, which had right. straight wings. Yeah. Definitely not good for chasing UFOs, much less even accelerating at high yeah, speeds. That was in a great airplane. The F-106 interceptors based at Kinross Base in Michigan um, I think the top speed was 1,500 miles okay. an hour. And uh, I've heard stories where windows were shattered in some of the towns in Azilda and Chelmsford as these jets screamed in. Really? But the jets were actually sent six hours after the UFOs had long gone. Oh, that long? I couldn't figure out why. Yeah, the reason I found this out is because, to my surprise, two years ago, a radar technician that I worked at the base contacted me and his audio clip is on my website and he describes that the object they tracked on radar, there was a discrepancy between what the radar base was saying and what the Subbury Star was saying. There was other f four smaller objects that had been seen in town. One object parted from the others and mm -hmm. followed a McGraw family to Chemisford. Another object hovered over the Pioneer Manor seen by a staff of six nurses. And most of the Pioneer first... Pioneer Manor, folks, is um, nursing home. a nursing home. Thank yeah. you, Michelle. Yeah. And, but most of the first witnesses who actually saw it were all police officers, regional police and OPP. Yeah. Um, so you've got professional witnesses. Trained observers, yeah. Wow, that's incredible. And 
what he says, what radar technician uh, said to me, was the submarine star was basically saying that what they attract on radar was those similar objects, but he says it couldn't have been because those four objects were smaller in size and they were lower in elevation. They were below the radar line. They would have been lost in the ground clutter, as he says. What they were tracking on radar was something that would be akin to an aircraft carrier. And that was parked over lively somewhere. In the air? Yeah, in the air. Between 42,000 and 72,000 feet. It stayed oh there for over two hours. Oh, God. Yeah. So, I mean, there's nothing now that could compete with that type of size. Certainly, there couldn't have been anything back then. No. Not that I can think no. of. And it was not weather propagation. That was one of the explanations, actually one of two explanations back in 1970. But they always search for something well, like that. Well, you know, the first yeah. explanation was Jupiter or Venus. Now, you know, you have to have a pretty damn good radar setup if you can actually track Venus or Jupiter in the Earth atmosphere. And Venus isn't <laughs> going to travel that fast. During that, uh, or come direction. close to us because yeah. it'd be a major collision. Uh, and the other explanation in 1979 was Forget the Jupiter-Venus explanation, it was ice crystals in the clouds. Ice? Oh, yeah. yeah, ice crystals in the clouds. And yet, uh, this guy was a private, and even though he wasn't trained to look and recognize objects behind binoculars, using binoculars, mm -hmm. his CO was. And his CO described seeing, on one particular object, the surface looking like a crater surface, like the like surface of the moon. And uh, one, other ob one other object that they had spotted actually uh, sent down a shaft of light through the clouds, uh, or shafts of light were emanating from the object through the clouds. But uh, to well, listen... This is, this is the height of the Cold War too, right, Michel? So yeah. uh, it's, it's no wonder that the jets were scrambled, because they probably thought perhaps, God forbid, it was an invasion or something from the Russians. Because as... This is why the dew line was set up, because they yeah. were afraid that the bombers folks would come from Russia right over the Arctic, of course, because that's the closest way to come, over Canada to the United States. This is why they set up the dew line as a protection, yeah. primarily a, uh, a first warning system to send the jets up to intercept these guys. So it's no wonder that yeah. it raised some, you know, I wonder if the president was, was waking that night. Uh I would assume so, because the other Prime four Minister bases, well. the other four bases that were affected uh, by these uh, intruders, um, which in some cases were described as black helicopters, that's because all they saw was a triangular beam of light shining down mm -hmm. over the weapons storage areas. Understood. And it took place at Loring Air Force Base in Maine, Ward Smith Air Force Base in Michigan. Um, Minot Air Force Base in, I think it's North Dakota, if not, if not South Dakota, mm -hmm. and Malmstrom Air Force Base in Montana. And so, and Falconbridge um, was the fifth. And uh, it was made famous because of that particular case. Now, I'm assuming that the UFOs having had a lock on to them um, must have known that that's what the radar base was there for. Yeah. So. Years later, in 1990, October 9th, I'm assuming that they were coming to see why the base wasn't operating anymore. Mm -hmm. You know, and it's almost like almost showing up and saying, "Ah, uh, you know, we're here," and or whatever. Cheeky, eh? Yeah, cheeky, cheeky boogers, yeah. Eh? Folks, Michelle Deschamps, our guest tonight, and if you're like me, I'm glued to this suit because whenever Michelle's here, he's got these incredible stories, uh, and they're all true. Yeah. You know, uh, bottom line, this is what the research has shown. Uh, as he said, this was in a reputable newspaper, the Sudbury Star. Um, so these are true things that have happened. Uh, the unexplained, it's out there. This is why Night Fright exists. www.nightfrightshow.com. Click on Michelle's picture. We'll take you right to his website where you can access pictures. You can access stories, true testaments. All this stuff is on Michelle's website, which is www.newforce.com. If you're watching right now on video, I appreciate you all tuning in to watch. This is a weekly show, Night Fright is. It's um, videotaping a radio show. It is not a television show, so to speak, yet. Hopefully it will turn into one. But basically what we're doing, we're starting out videotaping a radio show. Now, as you all know, if you're listening over the radio right now, this show is syndicated across the country, Canada that is, from coast to coast to coast, 
www.nightfrightshow.com. Go there. The most important thing there are the archives. There is a ton of material in the archives. The reason why I mention that is because everything there is free for you to download. No problem whatsoever. Stick them on your iPod if you're going to school. Stick them on a CD. Stick them in your car. If you're going to cross the country. Incredible, incredible stuff. There are mysteries plethora out there. Something I've just put up on the website that you want to check out. There is a ghost sighting. Now this thing just creeped me out. It is from the depths of Iran. That's right, folks, Iran. What I've done with the picture, it was sent to me. There's a young lady there with a hijab on, sitting on a rock. I've blocked out her face because it's Iran, folks. I mean, if she gets caught showing this to the rest of the world, she could be killed. So we have to be very careful with this. I've blocked out her face, but beside her when she's sitting on this rock are gauze-like creatures. And I kid you not, check it out yourself. You know, I get lots of uh, photos from folks out there of orbs, of ghosts, of strange paranormal things. I have never seen anything like this. www.nightfrightshow.com I can't make heads or tail out of this. Take a look at it and email me. Tell me what you think because that's important. I'd like to find out what you guys think this thing is. Right now we're talking with Michelle Deschamps. We're going to go back to Michelle Deschamps. We were talking just recently about some sightings he had seen, and we were talking about the Dew Line. That Dew Line, of course, folks, was a radar series of radar bases right across Canada as an early warning system to uh, a Soviet attack. We were very worried about the Soviets attacking, of course, during the Cold War, and this was a first line of defense. Many, many cases of UFO sightings have been around military bases. And here's where I finish the arc. Area 51. Let's go there right now. Michelle's an expert on Area 51. Well, there's a there's, there's clarification that needs to be made about Area 51. Um, in 1989, a young scientist by the name of Robert Lazar claims to have worked oh, at an area called Area S4, which is 15 miles southwest of Area 51. Mm -hmm. um, Papoose Lake? Papoose Lake. Papoose Lake. My assumption is that the reason why so much attention has been brought on to Area 51 is because probably because of line of sight. Uh, back in the day when they had access to one of the hilltops and they could look on to Area 51. Yes, sir. Possibly, I'd like to see like an actual map or for location purposes, but I'm thinking that when they would, when Bob Lazar, after he, he quit his job, he would take people up there t because he knew exactly when they would test this vehicle that they have. They only, they had nine vehicles stored at S4, but only one was in functioning, uh, was, was functioning. The other nine were different tested. They would they, they would they would shoot a projectile through it to see how much N penetration. Now, when you be. say vehicle, yeah, you're talking about these are recovered, recovered, UFO. recovered, okay. recovered, recovered yeah. UFOs. Okay. There was nine different models. One looked like a like a mold, like a cake mold. Another one looked like a top hat. Um, mm -hmm. The one that he worked on was look. He calls it the sports model because it's very very sleek, and the the propulsion system. All with system the same is, type of beings. You think that piloted them? Well, he thinks so because the propulsion system was similar from one to the next to the next, so they Those must have shared rays, technology. I guess, that we so that, well, who knows? Possibly, who knows, yeah. Okay. Um, Fair enough. So, I'm thinking that people overlook, looking from the top of the mountain, looking at the test at night, were actually looking towards the direction of Papoose Lake, mm -hmm. but assumed that the sightings and the UFOs were lifting off from the Groom Lake area. Mm. Groom Lake is only famous because it's got the longest runway in the world, and I believe that's where they tested the uh, the U-2 fighter plane must, might have might have come from there, or tested there. MiG-29s are being tested there, or at least kept there, mm -hmm. uh, and uh, whatever else they they might have come up with the Aurora, which is supposedly be able to uh, travel at uh, Mach five or four. Salt Bed Lake, right? Pardon is, me? That, is it a Salt Bed Lake? Salt Bed Lake, yeah. Okay. Well, they're both they're both they're both salt lakes, dry dry lake beds, mm -hmm. uh, Papoose and uh, and Area 51. But Area 51 has those buildings. See, at Papoose Lake, um, the hangars are actually 
the doors of the hangers are actually at 30 degree angle and they're made to look like textured sand so the satellites like Russian satellites this is how they found out the Russian satellites uh, actually went over and I have a popular mechanics or popular science magazine that has an aerial photograph a satellite photograph of both Groom Lake and Papoose Lake wow. but it was taken by a Russian satellite and uh, you can't even tell where the hangar doors are. I mean, it's they're they're made to look like the rest of the desert right. area. Everything's camouflaged yeah. accordingly, right? Yeah. yeah. But Bob Lazar stipulates that when he was there, uh, the the installation must have been fairly new because the 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 paint the, the coat of paint was fresh. I mean, everything looked new, mm -hmm. and uh, the hangers actually, when you were on the inside of the hangar, there was also like these side doors. You could see all nine vehicles parked in their particular hangars. Mm -hmm. And uh, he would be sh taken to this room every day on a daily basis and looked at briefings. And that's how he learned that uh, we were genetically manipulated about 65 times over a period of 300,000 years. And these are all information they've collected from captured aliens. Now, I've had folks on the show before, as you know, um, just check the archives again, folks, uh, www.nightfrightshow.com, who have talked about alien manipulation in our genome. Yeah. Many people think that we were created in order to become a source of cheap labor, if you will. Uh, the aliens who manipulated our genome, which was primarily apes, with their own, um, to give us a little bit of a brain, <laughs> Uh, and somehow we've become autonomous, and this perhaps could be a threat to them in the long run, especially given, and now I'm going to jump to Roswell a little bit, I'm mm. going to go back and forth a bit here, because we have created nuclear bombs. This is a big, yeah. big worry for them. Yeah, and that's... Want to talk a little bit about that, Well, that, that's pretty well when everything... Oh, I believe sightings have been taking place since biblical times, possibly even before then. But when they did, when at Trinity site, the Trinity site at uh, near White Sands, New Mexico, when they first dropped the first bomb just to try them out, was a beacon that was sent out, more or less. See, what we saw was a shock wave, the visible That's shock right. wave that shook the trees and the buildings and stuff. Shh. But I believe there's another wave that went out to space, and these aliens just all of a sudden got their, their attention got, you know, they, are, they all mm. perked up, and it says, oh, Looks like the kids have found the matches. Let's, That's a good analogy. Looks yeah. like the kids have found the matches. Yeah, let's yeah. go and check out, see what they're what they're up to, yeah. because you know we're dealing with stuff and fooling around with things that we don't understand the consequences. Yeah. And true story, Ashley, folks. When they first tested the very first test of a nuclear bomb, or I should say an atomic bomb, they thought that they could essentially light the whole of the Earth's atmosphere on fire. Now, personally, I would not have done that experiment, hmm. but you know what? They went ahead and did it anyways. Thank God the whole of Earth's atmosphere yeah. never caught on fire. But that was one of the theories that could happen, and they went ahead and did it anyways. It just shows Michelle's analogy is quite accurate. Michelle Deschamps is our guest tonight, by the way, folks. The children have found the matches. Yeah. <laughs> and the other plan that they had in mind was actually to detonate a nuclear bomb on the moon. And I'm assuming that could have knocked the moon right out of its yeah, orbit that's and that's would have a, caused... That's exactly what I thought. Yeah, yeah, because the moon controls our tides. And yeah. who knows, if the moon's no longer there, I just don't want to even imagine what, could, what would happen. Depending on the way it knocked it, yeah. it could have come right into us. Well, yeah, you know, it's, we, we it just... Scientists are... If they think they can do it, they'll do it yeah. regardless of ethics. They'll throw the ethics right out of the window and they don't they'll just care about the do it. Yeah. Yeah. They, or they don't really want to think about it. You know, yeah. they throw common sense out the window yeah. along with the ethics. And so it's, it's, we're lucky. We're, we're really lucky that we're still standing because okay. there's so many times we could have done ourselves in. That's right. And I think that to the aliens, um, because I think they had a, their hand in our creation or development, whether it was accelerated or not, I believe it was over time. Um, They've had no choice. I think for them, it's a question of survival. They've, I believe, they've lost the reproductive capabilities, and so that's why you have the abductions occurring. Yes. Yes. They're using Earth females as a womb to, to, to sort of gestate the fetus that they've implanted for three months, 
period. Three months later, they remove the fetuses. There's many cases where a woman claims to have been pregnant. They go and check. They, get a, they do a DMC. The fetus is there. They go back three months later. The fetus is gone. No explanation. You're listening to Night Fright. Your voice in the dark for paranormal and conspiracy radio. The time is now. And now your host, Brent Holland. And as soon as you mentioned what the fact that yeah. these women were pregnant, and I'm wondering if they take the fetuses out at a certain developmental stage mm. in order to manipulate even further to make them even more of a yeah. hybrid. Well, I'm not, you know, we're not at the point of, of doing it ourselves, I guess, we're, because we haven't been faced with um, annihilation. Self-annihilation. Mm -hmm. See, these these beings, I guess they've they've had to, I guess, weigh the pros and cons and say, well, okay, we might lose the purity of our race, but we need to find compatible bipeds with which we can match our genes. That's right. And just prolong our existence, mm -hmm. no matter at what cost. And maybe because, and this is where it hits us in the face, because we have free will, and we don't like to think that we may be somebody else's lab rats. And so this may be why they sort of have rights over us, mm -hmm. even though we may not agree with that. Mm -hmm. And so they come and take us away and um, erase our memory. Not exactly a perfect science, because in some cases they've, they might have erased the memory of a person for a whole week, and yet that person went and went to work, went about its duties, mm -hmm. and yet wouldn't even remember anything else. It's like a, a, an overdose of amnesia, so to speak. And well, so, go ahead. And so the aliens are they're, they're just creatures like us, you know, more advanced, but definitely uh, inf not infallible. I mean, their vehicles crash just like our planes, and we keep boasting that we have the best technology ever, and the planes are still falling out of the sky. Yeah. So, you know, I used to work at uh, Cold Lake Air Force Base, and they'd be getting uh, another 25 of those uh, F-18 jet fighters at $27 million each, and they would develop fissures in the wings, and they lost quite a few uh, pilots. So, and yet the, the F-18 fighters, fighter jets, are the most advanced jets that we have. Well, there's the YF-22 Raptor mm -hmm. that I think is also stealthy, I'm not sure, and the F-117 uh, stealth fighter and the, uh, the bomber. But the thing with, um, with these vehicles is anything that is man-made that flies has wings, which totally um, separates itself from UFO sightings. UFOs don't have wings. They're, these are usually oval-shaped objects, and these beings have somehow mastered uh, space travel and uh, I, don't know, I don't think they're traveling back and forth to the home base. Uh, you know, I, I think they've actually placed certain bases. Um, in closer proximity. In closer proximity, so they, can, they don't have to go back. I mean, it, I'm sure they, they've probably had, you know, they've looked at the logistics of what it was like to, to just travel back and forth to a home planet. So, no, they're not traveling billions of trillions of miles just to mutilate a few animals and then go back home. It makes more sense if they're going to keep a closer watch on us to see what we're going to do next. They're going to have bases on the far side of the moon, which is a perfect hiding spot. And it's Agreed. it's come out. It's come out in uh, the National Press Club where people have worked for NASA. They know that there's a special team that whitewashes pictures. Mm -hmm. They'll remove anything that could be a UFO on a, on a lunar picture or an Earth picture. They'll remove and whitewash the picture Any before anomaly. it's sold. Yeah, before it's sold to the public. Mm -hmm. So you have this team that actually does that. It, they, they process the film, and then if they want to sell pictures of the moon to the public, they make sure that there's not a single UFO that was accidentally captured by, by camera. Understood. And, and so when you hear about this and you listen to this, you're saying, holy crap, the secrecy and the whole, everything is just goes so deep that they, think, they seem to think whoever they are that's in charge of the secrecy seem to think that they can keep the secret forever. But the thing is, it's like a pot of chili, let's say, or whatever, that's, that's overspilling, 
and somebody's on top of the lid trying to keep it closed. Keep it closed. But it's like me going back to the olden days before my sightings and trying to close the floodgates, yeah. and you can't close the floodgates. Once you have that open or openness of your mind, mm -hmm. and you've had these sightings, and after, it took me after my my tenth or eleventh sighting to after I've it's after that after the tenth and eleventh sightings I've stopped rationalizing my sightings. I used to go through my own checklist and say, okay, it's not a helicopter. It doesn't behave like a helicopter. It's not a satellite because its flight configuration is completely different. There's there's sound or whatever. That's right. So mm -hmm. once you've reached that point of no return, you're you're basically done for, and you're taking your chances in speaking out. But I, I, it took me a long time to, to come up. But like I said, the, the, the sighting in 1990 uh, took me three days to gather up the nerves to call the police. And I was, at the time, I wasn't aware of MUFON. I became a member of MUFON in 1991. What does MUFON stand for? Mutual UFO Network. Okay. And it's ba it was based in Texas back then, but now it's based in Colora Colorado. You're listening to Night Fright. Your voice in the dark for paranormal and conspiracy radio. The time is now and now your host brent holland folks if you're just joining us we're talking ufos tonight with none other and none better michelle deschamps who i consider one of the leading world experts on ufos and we are so lucky to have him live in this studio tonight uh, if you're listening on radio www.nightfrightshow.com you can click on all the archives online, just download them free. All those wonderful shows are there for free. JFK assassination stuff, as you know, nobody does it better than Night Fright. We have all the first person witnesses that were in Daly Plaza that day, even the doctor who worked on JFK right after he was shot, just minutes. And you know what? What he told us he saw, the back of JFK's head blown out, do, does not appear in the official autopsy photos. Mm -hmm. Oh yeah, right here on Night Fright. We're talking about UFOs as I mentioned before. Now, if you're watching on TV, or if again, once going back, if you're listening on the radio, you can watch our show on TV. We've set up the Night Fright website as a focal point where you can download the show either in video format with actually seeing the host, Brent Holland, and our guest, right beside me tonight, Michelle Deschamps, or you can just download the audio. Whatever you want, it's there for you. Um, again, everything is free, so I encourage you to go to the www.nightfrightshow.com website. Watch the video. It's well worth it because there's information, of course, that we can put up, authors, books, things like that, um, maps sometimes that we can put up in the video that just aren't available in the audio. But either way, you're going to get a dynamite show. Mm -hmm. Number one Canadian-based show in the country. How great is that? And that's because of you for watching right now. www.nightfrightshow.com. We're going to go back to Michelle now. We're talking about aliens. We're talking about UFO. We're talking about Area 51. We're bringing it all together, folks, tonight with Michelle Deschamps. Michelle, what is it on this earth yeah. that the aliens are looking for? Are they just keeping an eye on their children? Are they? Is there resources here? Um, well, is it resource based? I'm assuming it's like anything else. If we were to go to Mars or make it there, mm -hmm. first thing we do is take samples, mm -hmm. samples of plant life, if there were to be some, and rocks, and just you know, because basically, even like meteorites that crash. I mean, we'll cap, we'll we'll collect those, to um, you know, to find how find out try to find out try to find out how the universe got created or how it yeah. all started yeah. um personally i i don't know if we'll ever you know get that answer i mean it might be like a lifelong project that they have but Who knows it, it you know it's it, it's it's life encompassing and it's like sometimes you wonder if it's worth uh, sticking to it yeah. that long um with me i guess i'm one of the lucky few because not only am I a researcher, but I'm also one of the very few researchers, I'm not the only ones by, by any means, that's actually seen UFOs. So that's why I'm able to say what I've said and able to put on the website what I've put on the website and stick to the facts because um, 
whether or not I'm a local celebrity, the thing is, is if I lie about one thing and it were to be found out, then people would assume right away that I've lied about everything else. That's right. It's credibility. And it's credibility. It's reputation. It's credibility. It's credibility and yeah. reputation That's is right. worth more to me than all the money in the world. Yeah. You know, you can lose, gain money, lose money, fine. But if you lose your reputation, you can never get it back. Yeah. And that's that's something that's very, very important to me. Well, let's continue with that, folks. We're speaking with Michel Deschamps tonight, MUFON Director for Ontario, none better on UFOs. Michel has started doing lectures at the university level, and he's done one here, actually, at Laurentian University just a few weeks ago. He's available for you if you would like someone to come in and talk authentically about UFOs. I would encourage you to get a fellow Canadian, Michel Deschamps. He would be happy to come to your university. Easy way to get his coordinates, www.nightfrightshow.com. Just click on Michel's picture. He's the handsome guy with the beard. It'll take you right to his website, and I'll give you that URL too, just in case you're traveling, which is www.nufors.com. All his contact information is there. He'd be happy, more than happy to come to an area near you or perhaps on campus to give a talk on UFOs. And I'm sure many of you listening right now that are interested in this subject matter may have had experiences mm. of your own and none better to share them with than Michel Deschamps. Michel, let's talk about that lecture that you gave. How did it go? It went pretty well, uh, I have to say. You know, it's all over town. Uh, I, I, apparently, it went fantastic. I mean, people are talking about it everywhere I go. I hear Michel, Michel, Michel. <laughs> Did you hear the guy about the UFOs, Michel Deschamps, UFO man? Tell us more. Uh. <laughs> well, my, I have an agent, promotional agent, as a matter of fact. <laughs> she's not getting paid so far, but, she, but she's pretty cool. She's 79 years old, and she wanted to get involved, and so... She is doing the legwork to try to have me speak at other universities and colleges. Bravo. And she came up with an idea, which I thought was really, really good, uh, an evaluation of, UFO, of my UFO research uh, lecture. And so what we did was... Uh, Straight A's, I she, Well, she created the questions, and then she... You want to read a couple of them? Sure. Um, so basically it says... Uh, Evaluation of UFO Research Lecture, presented by Michel Deschamps. And the first question was, was the pre presentation too long, too short? And Andrew Muncaster, the professor who was the teacher of the class, Dimension of the Paranormal, this is what he wrote. The, presenta the, pre the presentation was the perfect length. Mr. Deschamps clearly made an effort to deal with the important issues while leaving enough time for an engaging question period at the end of his presentation. Two, did the presenter stay on topic? Yes, he stayed on topic. Three, did the presenter cover enough areas of the topic? If not, can you suggest what other areas of UFO information could he have covered? The presentation covered exactly the breadth of material we were looking for. Wonderful. Four, did you feel that the students benefited from the information? Yes, I thought the students benefited a great deal from the information. It is always beneficial to have another voice in the classroom yes. to challenge the students That's and right. the instructor That's to right. think outside the box. That's right. Five, did you have any feedback from the students? Yes, the feedback from the students was very positive. They kept asking if we were going to have other similar speakers in the future. Six, what did you like about the presentation? Please elaborate. What I liked about the presentation, aside from the fact that Mr. Deschamps clearly knew his stuff, was the PowerPoint presentation which detailed images drawn from his own research. 7. What did you not like about the presentation? Please elaborate. And he basically said, I enjoyed the presentation a great deal. I wouldn't change anything. Bravo. You're listening to Night Fright. Your voice in the dark for paranormal and conspiracy radio. The time is now. And now your host, Brent Holland. Folks, we're talking with Michel Deschamps tonight. We're talking about UFOs. We've been discussing Area 51 sightings here in Canada, right across the country from coast to coast to coast. Easy way to get in touch with Michel, www.nightfrightshow.com. Click on the 
Click on Michelle's picture. We'll take you right to a place where you can reach him, which is his website, www.newforce.com. Now, Michelle, there's a story about you that many people don't know, and that's a near-death experience Michelle experienced when he was quite young. Can you tell the folks about the time that you almost drowned? Yeah, that was in July of 1988. I was visiting with some friends. We were having a little get-together. Um, we were we had participated in a program called Katimovic mm -hmm. back in 84, where you spend nine months out of the year. Yeah, we've only got three minutes. Okay. And uh, so we were getting together, and before we even got to, we went to London, uh, my friends took me to Port Colborne, and we went to a place called Pleasant Beach, and we went swimming. And unknown to me, there's a very, very powerful undertow in Lake Erie, in that area, and actually would drag us out. Oh. And uh, after... Uh, after waving our hands, uh, people on shore thought we were joking around. My friend Jim, who was, tall, who was taller than me, actually managed to grip the sand with his toes and made it to shore. And a vacationing doctor from Buffalo grabbed a dinghy and came out to get me. Uh, first, tan first time out, he actually handed me the paddle. And uh, by then, I'd been battling the waves and the undertow for, I don't know, six, seven minutes, Jeez. maybe more than that. And the paddle, a wave came, pushed a dinghy away, and I slipped, the paddle slipped away from my hand. So when he came around again, uh, around the dinghy, there was these little rubber hoops, whatever, with a little nylon string around. So I said, okay, I'll grab the string. But again, I was too weak, it couldn't hang on, and a wave came and pushed the boat again. And I, right away I thought, this is I'm done for now. And uh, I started seeing images of my family, my car, my job, and uh, actually literally seeing my life flash before me, but in slow-mo. Wow. And so when I saw that he was paddling back towards me, I said, okay, this time I'm sticking my major finger right in the loop, whatever it takes. So I actually got managed to stick my finger in there, and by the time they dragged me to shore, I was limp, totally limp. Mm. And... I don't think it's because I just had, there was a little place on the beach where they were selling pizza slices. So mm -hmm. I'd had a couple of slices of pizza, but it wasn't that. It was the undertow that took us out. And we were out like for 60 yards, maybe maybe further out. And uh, so I was limp by the time I got to shore. They called in the ambulance. I remember riding the am on the ambulance. And then when we got to Port Coburn Hospital, uh, first thing I asked off after, they did an EKG and an ECG. Um, I asked for a glass of water because I just swallowed like I don't know how much water off of Lake Erie but uh, I just uh, and then when I got off and I got off the bed I see all the sand everywhere and I asked the nurse if I could stay to help her clean but she says that's okay you can just go home so and I and it was it was I was scared because sure. that same night I was I was going to catch the Greyhound bus to come back to Sudbury oh, I see. come back home and uh, I shouldn't have told my mom, but I told her a few days later, and yeah, she uh, said, man, you came close. I said, yeah, I came close. I was probably a minute away from... How has uh, that changed you? Well, that's why I don't hold any grudges. That's why I know for a fact that life can be short and it can be done just like that. Mm -hmm. And so it made me reevaluate my life and my perspective on life and how important it is to... It's not like I went to Disneyland and partied, you know, just living like there's no tomorrow. Um, you know, but I definitely, something in me changed from that day forward. And I felt it was important and I was here for a mission. I was some, there was something that I needed to do. And I guess that's eventually, more recently than back then, um, this UFO stuff is basically what's motivating me to... And I think, folks, everybody is here for a mission. We're going to have to start to wrap up. Unfortunately, we've run out of time. Michelle's a regular, guys. You know that. He's going to be back and back and back and back. He's not getting away that easy. Folks, Michelle Deschamps, I'm your host, Brent Holland. The show is Night Fright, www.nightfrightshow.com. Everything there is free. Download it. Enjoy. Thank you for watching. Thank you for listening. See you next time.
listening to Night Fright and your host, Brent Holland. The time is now. Your voice in the dark for paranormal and conspiracy radio. (laughs) 